and welcome to Whispering Hope Lesson Study. And with me this morning is Elder Nehemiah Joseph. And we're here to look at the lesson for today, Other Images. I will read the memory text for today. Our memory text is coming to us from Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7. I will read the scripture and Elder Nehemiah will do the prayer. And it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Let us pray. Father and our God, we do give you thanks and praise again for your goodness and mercy and your grace. I want to thank you so much for your word and for another opportunity whereby we can study, Lord, to approve ourselves so that we be able to, 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 to give an account for our standing with thee. And so this morning I'm asking you to be with Brother Jonathan and myself and be with the listening audience that what we hear today, oh Father God, it will quicken our hearts and our minds and we'll be ready to give ourselves to you totally, so that you can have control. You're coming soon, O oh God, and you're coming for prepared people. So as we do these uh, lesson studies from day to day, Lord, from month to month, I pray, O oh Father God, that souls will be brought to your kingdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Elder. Other images. Elder Joseph. Biblical scholars, they have long recognized the similarities between Israel's covenant with God and the other covenantal agreements between king, kingdoms. I mean, nations, you know, getting into agreement um, with each other. But it is important to note that these these agreements and these covenants, sometimes they are, they tend to be on, on one part, cold, brutal, you know, in a, in a sense. Now, I know you were a law enforcement officer, I mean, I know you were a superintendent of police, and so you have a little knowledge here. When we, when we speak of a, a, a covenant, there are a couple of things that you look for in that covenant. You want just shed some light on that for us. That legal agreement, a couple of things that you that should be in that agreement. Well, an agreement have several parts. Okay? One agree, I am going to do something for you. It's established. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you, let's say, $1,000. All right? So I'm the giver. And you are going to understand that you're going to pay me back over a period of time at a percentage. That is also stipulated. Also in that agreement, we might have, if you do not pay within a certain amount of time, the interest is going to go up. And if you don't pay by a certain time, then I'll have to take it to law. And if you do not, and the law, you know, well, what is stipulated within that agreement is that I may confiscate your property. I may take your car. I may take your land. It might be your house. Something must be, you know, uh, all this is engraved in the agreement so that you will know that you are obligated to, to return that which you have borrowed. So these are the part, part, points that we have to look for in a covenant. The agreement, what is to be given, what is to be had, and you, how, what is your input be? Are you going to pay $5 a month, $10 a month, or whatever the case may be? And so this is what, and we also saw, if we go back into the Old Testament covenants, we realize that Judah at one point had a covenant with, I think it's Sennacherib, where they had to pay um, Jews, they had to pay for their security, and they had to sign. How much they're going to pay? If they don't pay, they're going to be in problem. So from, from, from way back, God's people made covenant or agreement with nations around them for security, for goods. When I say goods, I mean trade. That's the word I want, for trade and all that. 
They come in, they do what they do, they buy, they sell. And it was stipulated that even with Jeremiah, when he was building back Jerusalem, right? The, the, the merchant, no, that's why Nehemiah, I think his Nehemiah told him, do not come on the Sabbath. That's an agreement. And if you come on the Sabbath, you're going to have some problem. Right? So this is what we see. And so the Hebrew people understand what covenants are, agreements are. And so God could speak to them in that language because they know what it was all about. Uh, Elder, God is creator. He is the lawgiver. How can the, the creator and the lawgiver, why was it necessary for, for God to, to get into this covenant um, relationship with, with, with Israel? As I have just said, they understand the concept of covenant, agreements. Now, it was necessary because God has stipulated laws that are necessary for them to keep. And so God said, these are my laws. I am going to bless you. I'm going to bless the Hebrew. I'm going to bless you through Abraham. And so because I'm going to bless you, this is what I'm going to do. All nations are going to be blessed by you. You're going to be the head and not the tail. I, 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 I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. All right? They went down into Egypt. God said, I'm going, God told Abraham, I'm, you, your people would be in exile for 400 days. I'm going to come get you. But listen here. This is what they got to do. You got to keep my laws uh, my, and my statutes. So I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bring you to a place where you will be satisfied, a place for you with milk and honey. But they are stipulations. Just like with Adam and Eve, he told Adam and Eve, from the beginning, they were, to live to, they were to live forever because God didn't make them to die. But God said, do not eat from this tree. That's an understanding. So right there, we understand what God did was to let them know, these are my rules and regulations. And once you keep these rules and regulations, then the promises that I have for you, you will definitely get them. You will enjoy them. But you must keep my laws and my statutes. Yes, Ellen, but before we go into some scriptures, the law, God's commandment law, how, how does that demonstrate uh, the love that God has for his people? Well, God, God's law is a transcript of his character. God's character is love. For God so love. God is love. Right? Bottom line. And so we see the first four commandments speaks about God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt make no images. Thou shalt not take the law of them in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. That is towards God. Right? From honor your father, go right down to thou, thou shalt not covet. That's towards man. So we see God's Ten Commandments is the love letter towards man. Within that, it encapsulates the total love that God has. He loves us with an everlasting love. And so that love is seen because if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to steal from him. I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to break into his house. I'm not going to become vicious to him. And if I love my parents, huh, I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to honor them. I'm not going to curse my mother and my father. I'm not going to beat them. And this is what Elder Jonathan this is in spite of some of us, our fathers didn't take care of us, you know. Our fathers just, you know, they, 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 they weren't around. It's our mothers alone raised us. But we came out to be good. But one thing I know, and my mother always tell me this, love your father and whatever he asks you for, once you can give it to him, give it to him. So that is, that is what God wants us to do. God loves us in spite of ourselves. We do so much things against God, but yet still, he reached out, the Bible tells us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Died for the ungodly. So he loves us. So he loves us. So we should never recognize in any way that God, he loves us. He is love. He is love. Okay, let's go to the scriptures now, Elder. And I'm going to ask you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. 
Yes, and verse 5. Okay, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5, it says, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Okay, and I'm going to read Deuteronomy 14 and verse 1, it says, Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 1 says, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any boldness between your eyes for the dead. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5. Elder, what is God saying to us here? What is God trying to show us here when he speaks, Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chases his son, so the Lord chases thee. You know, I, I have two sons and I love them with all my heart. I love them so much. I do anything for them. And even though that they are big men, they still come and say, Daddy, my oldest one, he loved to come and say, Daddy, I want this. The other day I was talking to him and he got into some little trouble. And I came to Antigua and I'm there talking to him. And I said, look, you, you, you are, you're a big man. And he said, you're my daddy. And anything I want, I'm going to ask you. He said, I'm looking to you. You see, a father becomes a role model for his children, number one, based on how he treats them. Okay? The children, the children look up to you. Number two, no father wants to see his son goes awry. He always goes after him. He does something wrong, he's going to go for him. He will go with him if he is in trouble. He will put up money to bail him if he so gets arrested. And anything that his son gets into the father is it. Not to say he's going to condone what he do, does. No. But to show him that I love you. And in spite of the fact that you have done something that hurts my heart, I am not going to sit on the sidelines and fold my arms and say, oh, he deserves it. No. And God does the very same thing for us. You see, when we fall in the mire and we deliberately sin against God, God comes for us. He comes looking for us as in the Garden of Eden. Adam sinned against him and Eve, and what did he do? He went looking for them. That's what love is all about. God comes to us. He's always looking for us. He's always trying to find out how we are. So he chases sometimes he allows us to go into certain places where we, our back is against the wall. And the only thing we can do is to look to him, is to ask him, Lord, God, have mercy upon help me. Look, there's no way out. And so at times he allows us to get in the situation to get our attention. That is his chastening at times, as he did to Judah. We know that the discipline of God, it is always educational. Yes. And at the same time, but then some, some folks would say to you that the discipline of God at times inflicts suffering and distress. Would you agree with that? No, I've God... Read it. God, God is just. You see, God is just. And there's a, there, there comes a time when love of God is always there, right? But when his mercy runs out. Because you're doing this thing over and over again. And so he allows you, like he did with, with, with Judah. He told Judah, you continue to walk or you continue to sin. And if you can, I'm going to allow the book to come and take you. Jeremiah preached and he warned them. And he to the extent, he says, if you stay here, the soul is going to get you. But if you go along into not, not Nebuchadnezzar, go along into Babylon, if you go along into Babylon, you'll be able to build a house down there, plant your vineyards. You're going to have a hard, hard lesson. Nebuchadnezzar is going to be a rule over you who is a hidden king. But he's going to be over you. But why, once you go down there, you're going to learn a, lot, a hard lesson. You're in a foreign land. Huh? You're going to live by their rules, but I am still going to take care of you. Huh? He said, you, you're going to have house and you're going to have land. But if you stay over here, 
in Judah, the soul is going to get you, you're going to die. So it's a hard lesson for them to learn. They're leaving where they are, but look, you, look what you see now. And we're talking about images. You see an image of God's love and compassion that even though he's chastising them and they're going to go into Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, at the same time, he's saying, I'm going to be your provider. What a mighty God we serve. So, Elder, um, in short, what we're saying is that even the, the suffering and the distress, perhaps, if we should word, use the word distress, that God will cause to come upon you, it is, it is to, to bring out the best in you. It is to, as it were, fear to say that that too, the suffering, is educational. Yes, definitely. You edu because because Israel, the, Judah learned while they were down in, in Egypt, in, in in not Egypt, in Babylon, right? On Nebuchadnezzar, there were some harsh things happening to them, but they learned about the love of God. They learned that God, even though they were in such a dire situation. They had their houses and they had their vineyards. So under the chastisement, you recognize that there's a hard lesson to learn and God is doing it for your better good. You come out more victorious. Look at Job. When Satan attacked Job, God allowed it to happen to him. Learning session. Look at the three Hebrew, he he Hebrew fellas. Right? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It was hard for them to really tell the book another, I am not going to bow down and worship your image. And God allowed them. That is chastising them. He, he allowed them to go through the fire. But we remember he said, if you go to the fire, you will not be burned. If you go to the water, it will not overcome you. Right? It will not overflow you. So it, it, it is a learning process. And once you've been through it, you can come out and say, God has taken me through. I have felt the hand of God. I have seen his mercy. You're seeing an image of God now, which is what? A, a, a God of love, a God of security, even amidst the fire and the, 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 the turmoil that you might go through in this life. And you trust God, right? You lose the job. But yes, see what happened, Brother Jonathan? Your bills are paid on time. Huh? The repo man comes to your house to take your car. And who shows up? Somebody shows up just with the amount of money you want to pay the repo man. Hey, isn't that good? Huh? So this is what we see. There's always a learning. And you know what happened? You get thrown off of that job. God allow you to lose that job. And as soon as things get real tight, you know what happened? Somebody call you. And you get a job that is better. And in a better position than the one you had before. This is what God does. There's always a learning process when God chastises and chases children. Hello. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. But the Lord had taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. Okay, and I'm going to read Deuteronomy 32 and verse 9, which says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. How, how does this help to reveal, as a short, the kind of relationship that God wants with us? God wants us to be the head and not the tail. He wants us to be in a relationship with him that he makes us prosperous. Right? He wants us to be prosperous. See what it says in Deuteronomy 420. Let's look at it again. But the Lord had taken you, brought you forth out of the iron furnace of Egypt to be unto him a people of inheritance. Right? Remember when the children of Israel left Egypt? He told them to go and to do what? Borrow. And they got so much gold and silver and everything when they were leaving Egypt. Right? They had the gold, the silver, 
and they had everything that was necessary for them to build the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? So our inheritance is not only financial. Our total inheritance is to inherit the kingdom of God, is to inherit the kingdom of God, to inherit the promised land. Not the earthly Cana, but the heavenly Cana. And it also speaks about, when you look at it from a prophetic point of view, you see it also talking about Jesus, where you, where you read that the, the inheritance of our salvation comes through the lineage of Jacob. And he's speaking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ to come. And that is our greatest inheritance because there is no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. There is no other way that sin could be paid for but by the blood of Christ. So for us to inherit eternal life through the lineage of Jacob, it is seeing Christ who died on the cross. So we see the total package. We see the image of God as a loving father who loves us. He's taking care of us. He wants us to be the people who the world will come to borrow from. To be the head. We need to be the head and not the tail. We are people who, when we return our tithes and offering to God, he said he will do what? Open up the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there would not be what? Room for you to hold it. No, this is the inheritance. This is, this is the image we see of God. As we see an image here of God as a great financer. Right? In giving, you receive more. And what he wants us to do, to, and listen in public, this is for all of us. He wants, as we get from him, he gives to us and we gives to others. And once he gives to us and we help, we give to other people, our storehouses will continue to be full. And we would be the people that the people would look around in our communities and see us and say, indeed, these people, but a Jonathan, Elder Joseph, but a, but a person. You see, but a person is going, how can you use his name? You see, but a person is going in Antigua with his security. You see that? It is God's blessings upon him. That's what God do. You trust God. God opened the windows of heaven and he poured for you a blessing. That's another image we see of God that he puts upon us, his people. I'm still looking at, at this verse and I'm seeing here that the, the figure of speech um, that is used to, to, to denote harsh servitude here. The iron furnace. You can recall in Isaiah, and Isaiah um, defines the disciplinary experience on the God's hand as a process of refining. As refining. So if you look here at this imagery that is being used with the furnace, you would understand that it is to refine us. Right? And so even in this process, we're going through the fire, through the furnace, right? It is to discipline us, a way of showing, as it were, God is trying to bring us back to show us how much he loves us, that even in our suffering that he allows us to go through, it is for our own good. I look at the, the gold and the silver that they got when they were leaving, but we know it was an iron dome. It was hard for them in Egypt. Remember the Pharaoh told them, no, you all want to go to, to Shabbat? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I, I am going to increase your labor. You're going to still have to bring this amount of, of, of bricks, but you're not getting not, no straw from me. So it, it's hard now, but you have to come with, with your quarter. So again, it's a learning process for them. But did they bring up their quarter? Yes, God allowed them to bring up their quarter. But so they learn. They learn that through hardship, you can still endure. You can still meet your quarter. Paul writes, do not be frightened, I'm paraphrasing here, of the fiery trials that you would go through. Paul called them light afflictions. They're going to come your way. The minute you give your life to Christ, the devil is going to come at you. And so he's going to beat you all the time. 
He's going to trouble your mind. He's going to trouble maybe your, 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 your relationship, your children, your fight. He's going to trouble you. But once you put your trust in God, God is your provider, another image of God. So even though the devil takes away that from you, and even though he beats you down, even though he brings sickness upon you, Paul called them light afflictions, which would accomplish, Paul say, a more glorious thing for you. And so God is asking us to continue to go through the, the, the difficult times. They're going to come. But at the end, he say, he who endureth to the end, the same shall be what? Shall be saved. Elder, I must, I must admit to you too, and to those who are listening and doing. Let's talk some real love. Let's talk some real love um, here, Elder Joseph. And we look at the family and the idea of the family. Look, Elder, you can't want a closer bond, a closer tie mm -hmm. than family, that family bond. We are told that even as early in grade four, when you, when you look at the family social studies, we're told that family love each other. You protect each other. You respect each other. Mm -hmm. You protect each other. All these are things that family do. And Jesus, after... Jesus suffered a rather shameful rejection at the cross. Mm -hmm. I mean, his, his disciples, I mean, most of them, I mean, were nowhere to be found. But yet still, after his resurrection, the two Marys were there and Jesus said something interesting. Jesus says, oh, go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and I will meet them there. My brethren, elder, my brethren, Jesus referring to his disciples. When he needed them, needed them most, they weren't there. He was hanging on the cross. He looked down, they weren't there. Mm -hmm. Judas betrayed him, sold him out. And Jesus said, referring to them as my brethren. I want to meet them. So go and tell them to meet me in Galilee. What is this saying about the love of God? This image of the love of God. The cross as an imagery. Of the love of God. The Bible tells us that he came unto his own and his own received him not. He has provided for, for them. We're talking about his, his, inner, his inner circle or the Hebrew people. He has provided everything from the Iron Dome. Right? He loved cloud by day, fire by night, manna from heaven, the shoe didn't wear out, the foot didn't swell, the clothes didn't get old and rotten, they had the best food manner, they complained, he gave them meat, he, do, he did everything, part the Red Sea, do, he did everything, not while he was on earth, yet still, he was, he held, healed the sick, raised their dead, preached to them, did everything, yet, at one point, Peter, when Jesus was preaching, Peter says, when he went into one of these um, villages and no one listened to him, Peter said, call on fire on them and burn them up. Jesus said, no, I come not to do that. I come to save life, not to destroy life. So then we see him here as a loving father, a loving brother, a loving commander, a loving leader who embraces everybody who comes within his, his area of confidence, right? Where he can really, they can really confide in him. And he did things that caused them to confide in him because he fed the people. Huh? They saw all his miracles. Now, now he was in a place where he needed his family 
to take care of him. They abandon him. And nothing is worse than when your family, who you help and you know your help, you do everything for them, Jonathan. And when you are in need, they abandon you. They turn their back. It hurts more than ever. Right? And why is it what they were spot in his face? Can you imagine? They beat him, they slap him. And the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, had the audacity to say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. What ungratefulness you can see there. Let his blood be upon us and our children. We reject him. He's not our king, he's not our Messiah. And by the way, let me put this in right now. Some of the Jewish people are still looking for Messiah. Right? Because they say Jesus is not the Messiah. He, the Messiah is still yet to come. Right? So they are, they are confused up to now. But the point is, he still loved them so much that when he was resurrected, that you're saying, you know, he said, tell them, tell my brethren. You see what great love. And that's what God wants us to do to one another within the church and outside the church. Whether the person is a Christian or not, we are to love everybody. And we are to love them to the extent that we can still say, this is my brethren. And within our family circle, our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, nieces and nephews, who does us bad, really, really turn their backs upon us. We should still be able to call them brethren. Whoever within the church does us wrong and we, they repent or they have not repented or you have gone to them and they reject you, you still ought to call them brethren. It shows the love of, this is what God is. It shows that you have put on Christ, right? You have kenosis. Christ emptied himself. It shows that you have emptied yourself and you have now put on Christ. So because Christ is in you and you have put on Christ, you are operating under the same umbrella with the same images or imagery of Christ being loving, kind and forgiving and once you do that huh, you can say go and tell my brethren come to my house because i'm having a celebration and i am i am inviting him also you my house is open to you come brethren my maids have decorated the place uh, the, the, the the lamb is baked uh, the fish is fried and stewed and the banana and the potato and the dashing everything is there come you are welcome. There is nothing between me and you. You can come and eat at my table. You are my brethren. Why? Because Christ is in me. He is the hope of glory. He is the one that I serve. So now there is, I can truly look into your eyes and call you brethren. I have nothing in my heart against you. And that's what Christ wants to do for us. That's what he has done for us. And he wants us to do that for all who comes within our, our circle of influence. And I can see you're getting real excited. and I'm Of getting, course. Like you're getting ready to preach. Like you're getting ready to preach. But time is upon us. I'm just going to give you one more minute, 60 seconds, to speak to somebody who about the grace and the love of God, even so undeserving. John 3.17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is salvation through Jesus Christ. No matter what you have done, no matter how deep in the mire you have been, God love is so great for you that he is going to step in. The Bible tells that God says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. God left his abode in heaven. He didn't pitch his tent in heaven. He didn't pitch his tent on the unfallen worlds. He pitched his tent with us here on earth. He wants to be with us and he wants to be with you. So there is no time that he's going, he says he's not willing that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's the great love of God. And no matter what you have done in your life, nothing is too great that God would not do for you. As a matter of fact, let me end by saying this. Look at David. David committed adultery and murder and God still called him a man of his own heart. Why? Because God, David repented and God loved him. Once all you need to do, there is nothing to add. Just go and tell God what you have done and tell him your problems and he is willing to forgive you 
and set you in a place as if you have never sinned and call you by your name, call your own name, his brethren. That is what God has in store for you. And it's all day for the given. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man open the door, all you need to do is to open the nod, the nod, the door up and turn it and open. And you know, Jesus Christ is right there. He will walk right in. He's not forcing you or coercing you. He's loving you. And because he loves you, you should open that door and let him walk into your life. And I can assure you, your life will be better from today until Christ comes I'll call you. Amen, amen, Elder, the love of God, how rich and pure. And here we have it with Elder Nehemiah Joseph. We want to thank you for stopping by and to go through today's lesson with us, the images, and we can see the love and grace of God being bestowed upon undeserving men. And women. Amen. I pray this morning that as we go, that we'll truly have a blessed day in Jesus. And as we do so, let us remember that COVID is real. Let us continue to wear our mask and wear it correctly, sanitize always, and to maintain our social distancing. Because on the other side of COVID, we want each and every one to be around as we continue the study and the fellowship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A blessed day to one and all.